Thanks for the introduction. Now, we're here uh, talking today about the hydrogen value chain. So hydrogen is a, a promising, potentially green, and complicated energy carrier uh, that could help decarbonize a lot of heavy industries, steelmaking, chemical manufacturing, ocean cargo shipping. So we'll be covering some of the challenges facing hydrogen uh, and uh, talking with technologists about how to unlock the full potential for the energy transition. So joining us today is Natasha Kostanek, founder and CEO of Ayrton Energy which is developing liquid organic hydrogen storage technology to enable safe, scalable distribution of hydrogen without the need for cryogenics or pressure. Rafi Garbedian is a CEO and co-founder of Electric Hydrogen, which is developing new electrolysis technologies to produce green hydrogen for heavy industries like ammonia and steel. And Tian Kun Wu is a um, founding CEO of Amogy, which is developing an ammonia to power system that releases hydrogen from ammonia that feeds into a fuel cell with the goal of powering uh, semi-trucks, cargo ships, and other heavy uh, applications. So I thought I would start us off asking about the supply side. Uh, obviously, uh, hydrogen is used in a lot of industrial applications today. Almost all of the hydrogen is produced using fossil fuels, primarily natural gas. So I'm curious if any of you could comment on so where the green hydrogen market is today, that is, you know, hydrogen produced using renewable electricity. May I jump in on that one? Yeah, please do. Hey, Maria, it's a great question. Um, uh, at our company, we are very, very focused at electric hydrogen on that singular question, how to make green hydrogen at scale and cheaply in an inexpensive manner. Um, I love the way you framed the the uh, introduction to this this panel, potentially green, and that's exactly right. Green hydrogen is potentially green, potentially zero emissions, but only if it is produced using truly green electrons, electrons sourced from non-emitting uh, generation assets. Of course, that could be hydroelectric, that could be nuclear, if you consider that as part of the, the green zero emissions uh, ecosystem. But um, in our point of view, the uh, the most scalable and globally accessible form of clean energy is solar and wind, uh, so-called renewables, um, which are luckily now extremely inexpensive from the perspective of levelized cost of energy. Uh, the only issue with uh, solar and wind, of course, is that the capacity factor is low. Right? They're intermittent resources that aren't operating all the time. And that puts the burden of cost. We think about levelized cost of hydrogen production. That puts the burden of cost on the capital plant. The capital plant, because it's only operating intermittently, small percentage of the time, has to be that much cheaper. That's a formidable problem, but we believe it's a problem that can and is being solved. Uh, that's, that's why we're in the business. And it's all about producing low cost green hydrogen from renewable electrons. I'll add um, that I think a lot of the uh, new projects that are coming are really coming out of collaboration and different hydrogen hubs as well, which I think is a great way for different groups to share their knowledge uh, and share their resources, which will you know, accelerate the adoption of uh, uh, renewable energy and, and green hydrogen, which I think is a, a very important going forward. And the more we can do um, to support those hubs and uh, support the collaboration, I think we'll continue to accelerate that market. I agree with the both of yeah both of the prior speakers, and just to add on, the one of the problems that we see for the green hydrogen production, of course, in addition to the intermittency of solar wind as well as the low capacity factor, and offtake is not really existing there. So there needs to be massive offtake coming to the market so that supplier side can really start building much larger supply of the green hydrogen. But that's also at the same time, it is coming, especially given the IRA and other tools coming to the state and other areas as well. And also hydrogen as a, other molecules such as ammonia or LOHC can really help start uh, improving that supply side because um, hydrogen in different forms sometimes can be transported and stored much more effectively. I realize that we actually, none of us quite answered your question. Um, I want to throw out one more, uh, one more word on this, if I may. The, um, uh, the way we talk about it in our company is th there's a hype to reality ratio in green hydrogen today, which is extremely large. So we, we track project announcements, electrolyzer, project announcements, green hydrogen production project announcements, 
Okay. Uh, we track the ratio of the, those to actually producing and those that have reached FID, financial investment decision. And those ratios are astronomical. So there's a lot of talk and a lot of people in the value chain in the industry are thinking about experimenting or experimenting on very small scales, megawatt kind of scales. The real game change occurs when the scale of hydrogen, green hydrogen production reaches 100 megawatt pixels and above, ultimately to gigawatt scales. And of course, that's not really happening yet. So we're at the very cusp of this industry. We're just starting to see the tip of the iceberg. And we don't know how big the iceberg is, but I think collectively on this panel, it's our goal to make sure that iceberg's really big. Yeah, thank you for all that. I think it's um, when you, as you said, there's a lot of hype, but also um, kind of excitement and um, hope that this uh, green hydrogen will sort of realize its potential. But obviously, um, the, there's still some catching up to do between what actually exists and, and you know the aspirations. Uh, building a bit on what uh, Sang Hoon said, uh, talking about kind of new uses or, or kind of building up the demand side as well. Uh, I'm curious if you could expand more on that. You know, we're not, we're talking not just about making hydrogen in new ways, but also using it in new ways too. So what are some of the exciting new applications that you're seeing, uh, ways that we could start using hydrogen? So probably I can start up. And of course, I mean, hydrogen for the use cases such as hydrogen-based trucks and hydrogen-based ferries are actually commercially available. But what we have been seeing as a potential challenge of deploying hydrogen at the massive scale has been around the transportation and storage of the hydrogen. That's probably where ammonia and LOHC can come in and help, especially around ammonia and LOHC. Probably I can speak for ammonia as, as given what we are working on. And ammonia-based uh, technologies and also applications are being developed very, very rapidly. Now people talk about using ammonia for power generation and shipping, especially the maritime shipping, where I mean energy density is, is highly important as well as the affordability of the fuel. Ammonia seems to be one of the one of the leading answers for decarbonizing that heavy industry in the next couple of decades. And countries such as, I mean, Singapore, Korea, and Japan, where renewable energies are not uh, large enough, those areas are also looking to use chemical like ammonia for decarbonizing the utility in the grid as well. So we see excitement coming from many different angles. But of course, there are still questions and challenges. But, but I stay and we stay pretty optimistic about those challenges to be solved in the next few years. Yeah, and I'll add a little bit more um, about the LOHC specifically that we've been seeing and some of the demand and, and the interest that we're seeing from potential markets uh, is like utilities being able to balance uh, as they shift towards more and more renewable energy as their grid and decarbonizing their grid. There's a need to balance the seasons, you know, winter versus um, summer supply and demand. And so being able to do long duration energy storage, uh, hydrogen is a really great uh, tool for that. And using a liquid organic hydrogen carrier allows you to store the hydrogen in uh, available infrastructure that we use today to store diesel or gasoline. And so you can reuse that existing infrastructure to manage that energy storage. Uh, and the other one would be backup energy generators, for example, like data centers or other places where you want to replace diesel or natural gas generators to decarbonize. Being able to move LOHC in a similar way that you would move or handle diesel allows us to decarbonize some of those uh, hard to otherwise um, decarbonize markets. One final word for me on this. Um, uh, so the existing applications for hydrogen, uh, ammonia production for fertilizer um, represents on its own about half of the global production or consumption of hydrogen. And rough numbers that that industry converting it to green hydrogen implies about a terawatt of new hydrogen production by electrolysis, massive, massive number. Um, and then when we think about the other existing opportunities for hydrogen, uh, it, it, it's, it's a, a, a massive market with a lot of opportunity without even developing new applications. But there are a lot of exciting new applications and they go from primary steel production via the d direct reduction of iron process, all the way to, you know, as mentioned already, the intercontinental transport of energy which um, is 
going to continue to be uh, part of the overall like energy landscape geopolitically uh, and an important uh, an important segment of the energy industry that needs to be decarbonized. We move hydrocarbons today. We're going to have to move something else in the future to supply parts of the world that are energy poor in one way or another um, with energy from now areas that are renewable resource rich. Yeah, that's a great point that we, it's not just that we need to, uh, or at the same time that the industry is looking to expand into maritime shipping, um, uh, you know, backup generators, these other applications, there's still a need to decarbonize existing hydrogen production. So it's, it's cleaning up what's already there and providing a pathway for other industries to decarbonize as well. Um, and I'm curious, and this is kind of building on what Natasha was talking about uh, a little bit, mentioning that existing infrastructure, um, to what extent does does the existing infrastructure for hydrogen, the existing supply chain, uh, support this scale up? You know, where is it uh, working well? Yeah, I guess I can jump in there first. Um, so for the technologies uh, such as uh, what Ayrton's developing with our liquid organic hydrogen carrier, or LOHC, you know, we can store hydrogen in a room temperature, room pressure liquid that can be handled no differently than diesel or gasoline, which allows us to reuse existing oil field infrastructure that would be tanks, tank trucks, rail cars, pipelines, etc. cetera. Uh, and so being able to reuse the infrastructure is uh, useful because it obviously reduces the cost. And a lot of that infrastructure has decades left in its life especially when you're looking at pipelines. And so being able to reuse that will also allow companies in industry to continue to adopt hydrogen. They'll be more likely to want to adopt it if they can reuse their existing infrastructure. I would echo that. So reusing existing infrastructure is going to be really the key to jumpstart the hydrogen economy using different chemicals. And ammonia is also pretty well positioned in that angle because as ammonia's current use case as a fertilizer, in the United States, for example, we have longer than 3,000 miles of the pipeline available and existing together with the 10,000 storage units, storage size, as well as globally carrying carriers and ammonia carriers, as well as other pores dealing with the ammonia daily basis. So that can really help in the adoption of the ammonia within the hydrogen vector for ammonia, I mean, as a fertilizer, as well as the ammonia as a fuel use cases as well. We can really leverage the existing infrastructure, which also comes together with the, the knowledges around the safety handling, safety transportation that people acquired over the course of several decades as building those infrastructures as well. Right, which is especially key, well, with hydrogen and especially ammonia uh, as well, given the toxicity and kind of these other characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, that there's sort of these existing protocols and expanding eff efforts to expand these protocols as well as it moves into new industries. 100%. Of course, I mean, ammonia as a fuel, that's the area people have never explored. But at the same time, ammonia as a commodity and the cargo, that's the area people have explored longer than about a century. So that knowledge is already being transferred to the new use cases, such as shipping or in the power generation, where people still handle the storage and dealing with the ammonia. So an infrastructure along with the transfer of the knowledge, will really help the industry to adopt chemical like ammonia as a new use cases to really enable the green hydrogen economy. And um, where are there instances where the existing infrastructure doesn't kind of meet the challenge? Where are you seeing it sort of fall short and what needs to be done to expand uh, how we move, store uh, hydrogen in order to kind of realize the full potential of, of this uh, of this energy. If I can, I'll jump in uh, on this one, then pass the baton. So, from my point of view, the infrastructure today is essentially non-existent um, and needs to be built or converted one way or another uh, fairly rapidly in order to decarbonize uh, the sectors we're talking about. Uh, here in the U.S., for example, there's probably the longest hydrogen pipeline is a few hundred miles long. Um, the, all of the substantial substantive hydrogen pipelines are in Texas, Louisiana, kind of that corridor around all the refineries and natural gas production in that region. And they really serve to connect steam methane reformers producing hydrogen from natural gas to end users, typically ammonia plants, but also methanol plants and refineries petrochemical refineries. 
We know how to do it. It's not very different than moving natural gas. We have a massive natural gas aggregation and transmission network in the US that ultimately needs to be converted or rebuilt out as a hydrogen aggregation and distribution network. It's not far-fetched. It is in fact what we did for natural gas over the period of about 40 years. Um, and so we know we know it can be done. Uh, the, of course, as we've already discussed, the impetus to building that infrastructure really comes from the production, being able to produce green hydrogen cheaply enough and at volumes, and on the demand side, converting use cases to take green hydrogen. We've touched on this a little bit already, but uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which Congress passed last year, uh, has potentially billions of dollars to jumpstart a hydrogen industry in the United States. And so I'm interested to hear from you uh, how you expect this infusion of money might affect your own companies in particular, but also sort of the broader hydrogen value chain. Uh, you know, what, what aspects might stand to benefit the most? Yeah, probably I can start. So, I mean, especially the IRA, which provides the $3 for green hydrogen, depending on the carbon intensity, that is actually accelerating the production of the green ammonia, given that ammonia uses, as Rafi mentioned earlier, hydrogen as a feedstock. So that uh, really accelerates the availability of the green ammonia, especially around the Gulf Coast area, where there are multiple really billion dollar projects going on to produce green ammonia from 2025 plus. So the availability of the green ammonia for our business, even if our company is at the downstream converting that ammonia to electricity, but that really gives the comfort for our customers about the future availability of the fuel, as well as the full scale decarbonization from well to wig. So that helps the company to really expand the business to multiple areas where, I mean, they were not really excited in the beginning, simply given their worries around the availability, but that is being relieved much given the IRA coming in the States. Um, I can just jump in and, and give the Canadian perspective because we're a Canadian-based company. And obviously the IRA isn't directly uh, impacting us, but uh, being that a big part of our market uh, and go-to-market plans are in the U.S. definitely helps us uh, be able to get a, a, you know, into the market here as it continues to be accelerated by those incentives. But we're also seeing the pressure on you know, the Canadian government to also match uh, the same kind of incentives uh, in order to stay competitive. Uh, in the hydrogen market. And that just is going to benefit Canadian companies and American companies that want to work in Canada as well. So it's uh, great to see countries taking the lead on those kind of initiatives. And it does, you know, uh, really encourage other countries to follow suit, which is great. Um, for those of you who are aware, my heritage is from the solar industry and uh, I'm kind of a solar old timer, which means I had the, the benefit of participating in the solar industry's growth, initial growth, that was largely driven by the German feed-in tariffs. Um, very, very robust incentives, not like the IRA, but of similar intensity and, and transform, transformative uh, uh, power. Uh, those incentives were in fact transformative and we would not have today's solar industry without such incentives. Um, but there's also a dark side to these incentives. Uh, because ultimately, um, as the industry matures and grows and scales and becomes cheaper and cheaper, the incentives need to scale back. And sometimes the political process of scaling in in incentives back is disruptive and nonlinear. Uh, so the IRA, from my point of view, is in fact doing what it should be doing, stimulating green hydrogen projects uh, in the U.S. And also, I agree, it's a very good point, stimulating international kind of alignment around other incentive programs in other countries. Um, however, I do remain quite cautious about how these incentives will ultimately unfold in the longer term. Um, and really, I think the whole green hydrogen value chain, the whole industry should keep its eye on the ball. We have to make green hydrogen production, midstream transport and utilization cost competitive to the alternative fossil resources. If we can do that and free ourselves from the necessity of incentives quickly, then the incentives will have served their purpose and the industry will grow organically. Uh, that's, I think, the, the call to arms for me. 
Rabbi, could you expand on, uh, you know, you said you're feeling cautious. I know there's concern that these incentives um, from the Inflation Reduction Act, other federal investments will kind of help accelerate growth of other sort of colors of the hydrogen rainbow, you know, made, those made from uh, gas primarily. Um, could you talk a bit about sort of more of the concerns you have and then and any others as well? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So lots of ways to make hydrogen Many of them um, derived from natural gas. Of course, if we can sequester the carbon from the conversion of natural gas to hydrogen, great. The structure of the IRA, excuse me, is actually remarkably thoughtful in this regard. The incentive uh, level is structured around or indexed to the carbon intensity of the product. As long as the rules, which are still being formulated, and it's a hot topic in Washington right now, as long as the rules really truly do capture the carbon intensity upstream of the hydrogen production in its entirety, then I feel very comfortable with an organic competition between all of the ways to make hydrogen at very low carbon intensity. Well, I think we need all of the ways to make hydrogen to really meet our net zero goals because we need uh, wind and we need solar, but we need hydrogen. Like We need everything to be able to really meet our net zero goals and uh, and fight climate change. And so anything we can do to encourage all types of hydrogen, I think are really great because there's going to be parts of the country that are easier to do green hydrogen with. And there's going to be parts of the country that are easier to do blue or turquoise hydrogen with. And then turquoise just being the, the newest that I've heard of that you um, make uh, methane into hydrogen and solid carbon, which can also be used in other uh environmental applications. And then blue hydrogen being uh, natural gas with carbon capture and storage. Is that right? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, and kind of building on that uh, thought, Natasha, I'll start, we can start with you. Um, I'm kind of curious about sort of um, this idea of potential competition for this renewable energy a generation, we're going to need so much of it for uh, decarbonizing the grid, uh, moving, you know, decarbonizing buildings, powering battery powered transportation, also producing green hydrogen. So how do you see sort of this potential competition um, shaping up and that sort of the need to, how, how should, you know, the country, the industries prioritize who gets the resources, I suppose? Yeah, I think that's a tough one. I think the market eventually will just figure that out for itself. I think there'll be, you know, different pushes for different types of applications in different market and different end uses that make the most sense. And I think as long as people focus on using the right type of hydrogen, the right type of renewable energy for the right market and right use case, I think the market will sort itself out on that. I think a great way to think about, um, and I know Rafi touched on this earlier, is renewable energy has a base load and being able to take that base load and the excess energy that the grid doesn't need at a time and be able to use that to turn into hydrogen, you know, is a great way to, to not take that energy away from the grid when it's needed, but to still be able to make hydrogen for other applications later. Yeah, I agree with Natasha that, I mean, market will figure out itself, but the earlier market adopting the green hydrogen will likely be the low, lowest cost options, I mean, available using hydrogen or other renewable fuels or energies to really decarbonize these industries. That is why, I mean, the policy, I mean, the subsidy like IRA is important as well as the policies and regulations has to be correctly structured so that we can decarbonize, we can really encourage those industries to adopt hydrogen or other renewable fuels to do the decarbonize best for getting the net zero. Otherwise, purely for uh, goodwills or purposes, it's not really going to be happening fast enough to really net, reach the net zero 2050 that we want to achieve. One point here, blue hydrogen is not renewable. Blue hydrogen is simply carbon captured hydrogen production. And we do also have to not only consider the non-renewable nature of it, you're pumping stuff out of the ground that can't be replaced, but we also have to consider the upstream methane emissions from the production of blue hydrogen. So when we talk about truly green hydrogen, truly clean hydrogen, this comment about careful accounting of emissions has to go all the way to the wellhead in the case of blue hydrogen, and it has to go all the way to the power plant in the case of green hydrogen. Um, I do want to reframe the question, though, and it's the question you asked is a very, very common framing. It presumes that renewable power is a finite resource, 
that can be built at a finite rate. And of course, it is finite in the rate that it can be built. But the real constraint to building solar and wind is actually not the equipment. The real constraint to building solar and wind is the interconnection to the grid and the ability of the grid to absorb variable renewable generation without breaking the ramping rate capability of the grid, of the other assets on the grid to support continuous supply and demand matching. Green hydrogen production, even off-grid green hydrogen production, directly coupled renewables to electrolysis, actually decouples a whole sector of industry that can use hydrogen from the electric sector. And that decoupling, rather than integration, of course, they can be loosely integrated, but that decoupling ultimately allows us to build renewables bigger and faster than we can build them just as electric resources. So I think it's not actually competitive. It, it doesn't have to be an either or, it can be an and. Thanks. Well, we have uh, just a few minutes left in the panel, so I wanted to open it up to all of you. If you had any uh, final thoughts or closing remarks that you would want to make about this this topic we've been talking about, the hydrogen value chain, its challenges, and how to unlock its potential. Uh, yeah, I just I think one of the things that maybe uh, we didn't get a chance to touch on is just as we continue to see these incentives and these um, programs like IRA being announced. The, the sooner we can have clarity on these incentives and exactly what they mean, uh, the quicker we'll be able to invest in projects and the quicker we'll be able to get these projects built. And so I think that's one of the messages that we need to continue as an industry ask for is, is clarity uh, from our governments and exactly what they're looking for and, and where are these lines so that we can start those investments and get those projects, you know, show ready and get them done. Yeah, I'll double down on, on that statement. Exactly right. Clarity and stability uh, and predictability in, in the um, legislative and incentive kind of structures, um, whatever country we're, we're in and talking about. Um, I would also just add that um, hydrogen to be successful, green hydrogen to be successful is a team sport. There is no single company or entity or even country on the planet that can do it alone. Uh, as we've been discussing, there's production there's the resource side of it, the feedstock, which is energy. There's the midstream, the transportation, conversions to other chemical forms, and ultimately the use cases. So this is really here we're, we're discussing a retool of the entire industrial infrastructure that we've built modern society upon. It, it's taken us a couple of hundred years to get where we are, and we're trying to reformulate that, retool that in the matter of 30 years. It's a massive global undertaking. Um, I'm really pleased to be here with, with a couple of other super smart entrepreneurs who are doing really interesting things. We don't know what technologies are going to ultimately lift and survive this transition, but we all need to be working on it uh, diligently and, and together. 100% agree with that. I mean, the collaboration is really the key. Collaboration from the upstream to the downstream, the regulators, policymakers, and all of these global collaboration is really the only enabler of the next year 2050. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult. And on top of that, we really have to really see the urgency that may be necessary in all places, in all players in the market. Because looking at, for example, the industry that we are often handling, often uh, speaking with, such as shipping or, or power generation, Shipping alone, I mean, usually the maritime vessels are going to be in the water 25 years at least. So if you want to re reach net zero 2050, we have to start building the boats right now, which is using renewable fuels and zero emission solution. But that is not really happening yet, but we are hopeful that we will see significant effort happening in the next few years. So which will likely be the case in other industries that we are usually talking about using hydrogen or other molecules as a fuel or as energy sources. So collaboration is the key, but the collaboration, all the collaborators have to feel the same urgency so that we can make that happen. That's how we, how we see this challenge and also the opportunity in the next few decades. Great. Thank you all for taking time to, to share your insights. I've learned a lot uh, talking with you and uh, this has been a great panel. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.